Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Charlton Live, sponsored by the British Institute of Kitchen, Bedroom and Bathroom Insulation. My name is Louis Meadows. This is the Big Match Preview as we gear up for Good Friday's trip uh, down to Exeter City. It's a Friday game, which is why we're on uh, a day early on uh, Wednesday evening as we return from the international break. Joining us uh, to look ahead to that game, and well, the man who uh, won't hear a word uttered about the international break, Tom Wallin. How are you doing, Tom? I tried to forget about it until you mentioned it just then. But, Looking uh, forward to a summer off at least, I guess. Put your feet yeah, up for a little exactly. while. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's just get it all out of the way. But uh, yeah, tough. I was actually at the England game last night as well. But um, yeah, yeah, tough game for uh, for Wales last night, sadly. But at least but, that ended nicely. Yeah, we have the joys of uh, Charlton being back on our in our lives again this weekend. So that's good. Yeah. Well, if it makes you feel any better, we knew for a long time that Charlton weren't going to be competing at the European Championship, so that didn't come as a surprise. Uh, also on the bottom of the screen there is uh, Joe Puddyfoot. How are you doing, Joe? Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. Looking forward to uh, having some football back and, you know, international break. We we did all right, I suppose, but still miss, still miss the proper football. It's just, uh, mm. just a holiday away from the, uh, the, the proper stuff. Mm, it certainly is. Well, well, we'll have a look back at the international break. I know we'll hear what Nathan Jones uh, filled his time with, uh, talk about a couple of uh, Charlton players who are involved in that uh, international break as well. We're going to look at the season ticket prices uh, later on in today's show. They've come out, just discuss a, a little bit about that and, and the fact that safe uh, standing is going to be uh, included at the Valley now, which we're really uh, looking forward to. We're going to hear a tiny bit about the upbeats because they were with uh, with the first team. Uh, over the course of the last couple of weeks. Um, so Nathan's going to speak about that. We'll let you know where you can uh, donate to our Upbeats Walk uh, page. And of course, we will turn our attention to the uh, away trip uh, down to St. James Park. We are facing Exit. See, we've got a really special guest, John Beer, uh, from the My New Football Club podcast and BBC Radio. Devon will tell us all about uh, the Grecians. And we'll hear from uh, Nathan Jones uh, about that game as well as we look ahead to the trip uh, on Good Friday. But first of all, uh, let's have a listen to what Nathan said uh, he managed to fill his time with uh, during the international break. Uh, I know it wasn't your preferred choice, but uh, have you been able to use the uh, the break in the league program to to our advantage? Yeah, look, well, we'll we'll see. But what we've been able to do is rest up a few, get one or two back, and and then put some real good work into them, which was which was essential, as I said, especially in the early stages when we've been here sort of six seven weeks. So to be able to have so sort of two three weeks to work with them, hopefully we'll uh, we'll see the fruition of that. The break has seen four of our squad travel to play for their country. Two of those are academy graduates, Croy Anderson, who played in both Jamaica's games in the Nations League, and then Nathan Asimwe selected in the squad for both games for Uganda. Uh, aside from the inconvenience of the break, of course, uh, how positive is that that Croy and Nathan have, have got that recognition, and how important and positive can it be for the future of, uh, for the club that they get that experience? Well, it is good, real good experience, and you're always proud of when you, when you get international players at whatever, you know, every club I've been at, we've had. Um, a real good selection of, of international players and it's that's important and we're proud of that. Yeah, I know it comes at an inconvenient time and so on, but you know, the, the fundamentals of it is they're they're good enough to be selected for their country and we're and we're proud of that. And especially ones who come through the you know, even Michael Hector and, and people that have been away. Um uh, Ashton Maynard Brewer normally goes away on, on international so there's there's a there's a few internationals here and, and we're proud of that and we only want to add to that. 
There you go. That's Nathan speaking to Terry earlier on today about the fact we're obviously um, when when into that international, international break, Tom. I guess I guess not at the ideal time for us considering. I mean, yeah, we're, we're we're eight games unbeaten now. Also, you have to take into account that we're not really going anywhere, and nothing really happens. So, it wouldn't have harmed us to to, to play the game and 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 get it out of the way, and not have to worry about a Tuesday game coming towards the end of the season. But it does afford Nathan that little bit of extra time on the training ground with the chaps, um, which hopefully he would have utilised the ones that remained behind. Yeah, and I think you said it on the last pod before the break which seems like a lifetime ago now but you and whoever we were on with pretty convinced that we're safe I think it might have been Sue as well um which I know mathematically we're not but realistically it's going to take some effort for us to get relegated from here so if we're not going anywhere then as you say coming in the middle of a good run it's not the end of the world you know if we were third or fourth bottom and scrapping for our lives and on a good run and trying to get ourselves out of it and suddenly that was dented it would obviously be a a much more of an effect in a negative way so I think for him this is probably the first proper opportunity he's had for a lot of the side obviously as he said the likes of Karoy have have travelled but for a lot of the side they probably are still here and he's been able to hopefully work with them he's also been able maybe to give them a bit of time off and also possibly in that time start to think ahead to next season now if we are safe there's a lot of work he needs to do in terms of who he brings in, who he gets rid of, what the side looks like next year. So maybe he's been able to make a bit of a head start on that. And if he has, then obviously that's that's really encouraging as well. So, yeah, uh, as I said, not just because Wales obviously lost, but just generally I, I'm not a fan of the international breaks anyway. Um, you know, I, I, it's about club football for me. Um, but, you know, it, it's done now. And, and as I say, we can kind of see out the rest of this season and hopefully start to think about next year as soon as possible and hopefully he's as i say had a bit of a head start in that mm. you know, it, it, say, it says something i guess about the, the confidence that nathan has in in the side that he would have preferred to have played even without maybe a couple of the bigger names that, that left so that the likes of Karoy obviously went off with um with jamaica a, along with michael hector i mean there was a a, a call up for uganda for, for nathan asimwe as well which is great for him but the, but the fact that nathan wanted to play i guess show, shows that he's He's quite keen to to, to continue that that form that we've actually been on recently, Joe. <clears throat> yeah, I think. I mean, I, I don't understand for Wigan why they wanted to call it off. I mean, they're sat in the uh, middle of the table. Uh, they're not going to go up. They're not going to go down. Um, so you know, why not? Why not just carry on and, and give some players an opportunity to sh- uh, to shine? And that's what we would have had some of those fringe players would have had an opportunity to come in and, and show what they're about ahead of next season. And Nathan would have had a perfect opportunity to, to put them in and if they didn't, you know, play to, to the standards he wants. It's not his fault. His hands are tied. So he's, he's lost that opportunity. Uh, but we do have, you know, strength in depth now across a number of different departments, a lot of players coming back. So we're not anywhere near as weak as we were. And, you know, Nathan, he himself says he wants players to to buy into into the philosophy and and take their chance when they get it. So it was a perfect opportunity for that to happen. But you know we're gonna obviously desperate for the three points and to avenge the uh, home defeat. So they want every opportunity they can to to come down and and take a scalp. Yeah, not many uh, teams need to avenge a home defeat against us uh, uh, this season, of course. Um, yeah, seventy six Rufus says uh, evening and after watching two England games this week. Hopefully we actually get. Uh, to have a team win uh, one or two uh, ourselves. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to admit, I didn't really... Cause I, I can't get into friendlies that much. So I flicked on a little bit of the the Brazil game. Um, I watched maybe the last half an hour of last night's game against Belgium as well. But I do find it a bit of a drag to to have it taken away from us purely for friendlies. All, all the interest, obviously, like I said, I did... Uh, uh, watch a uh, watch a br- very brave Poland side march into into Euro two thousand and twenty four last night. We won't go on about that. Lucas uh, has come to rub it in. He says cheers from Brazil. Well, me and Lucas had a ch- sort of a little bet as well before the before the England Brazil game. So now I owe I owe Lucas a uh, Charlton Live mug. Uh, so I'm going to have to DM him and work out. I'm going to get that over to him <laughs> over in Brazil. But yeah, the, they're uh, they win at Wembley means it. Obviously, we saw because of that. We we saw um. Our, our players who went away, first of all, before we, before we speak about the former Charlton players who played for England, Tom, the, the, like I say, I mean, in particular, Anderson and, and a Simway there getting called up for, for Jamaica and Uganda um, and, and playing games. Um, I mean, again, it, it goes to show, I guess, the, the, the level that some of our youngsters can play at. And what, what sort of experience does, can international football 
sort of give them that they could bring back to Charlton, I guess is an, in, is, is an interesting way to look at it because obviously they're good enough to play for those countries because they've been called up to them and they need players of, of our standard. But for us, we might see it as well. It's some, a chance for them to learn in a different environment and see how things are done in a slightly different way to how we do it. Yeah, in, in the same way you would if, if you sent a player out on loan, I guess. And I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I'm not going to claim to know the Jamaican and Ugandan sides particularly well. But with some countries, you obviously get, I don't know, uh, you, you get a particularly standout player that they might be playing with as well. And so there's the opportunity to learn from somebody that obviously in your club side, you'd imagine most of your players are going to be League One level as well. Might even argue some of our players aren't even quite at that level, but I wouldn't say there's many in our side that are sort of Premier League, for example. But <clears throat> there might be nations where you've got one or two standouts who just happen to play for a country who are who also can call up League One players because you know of the of the level of the nation as a whole. And so there's an opportunity there. So um, yeah, I think it's a great opportunity for them. I think just all the little things, you know, for somebody like Karoy, I don't know, you know, if he still lives at home, but obviously he's still very young to go and travel abroad like that and to, you know, do all of that sort of stuff at that age. You know, there's plenty of people who, who don't get those sorts of opportunities. So given the the awards that the Academy or the, the Community Trust have won recently and the, the good with the Academy, I feel like Charlton is all about building sort of well-rounded players. And I think, was it about Connor Wickham that Nathan Jones was talking about, you know, we like the person as well as the player. I think there's, there's a big part of that with some managers. And so if these players are getting exposure to different cultures, to different places, getting to travel the world is just a benefit as well. They might come back feeling relaxed and, you know, energised by all of that. There are huge benefits to all of that sort of stuff. So I don't know, maybe we're looking too far into it, but I definitely think there are things that you can take. And I imagine if anybody is going to look at the positives on something like that, it would probably be somebody like Nathan Jones who will try and focus those benefits and, and fuel them, definitely. Mm. Uh, all hell let loose says is Karoy still on his mum's passport. I mean, it would feel like a, a data protection breach if I knew the answer to that. Um, but um, yeah, I don't, don't know. He's very young, isn't he? Obviously, uh, still going out there. Andrew says a friendly is a ridiculous name uh, for a football match. Michael said, yeah, barely watched uh, either. But I mean, we did have we did have Charlton representation. Uh, obviously, with Conza and Gomez playing for England last night. I mean, it's nice when when, when you see that sort of occurrence with our players joe who who used you came for our academy getting out there putting our name about and it is a nice feeling and i guess it, it can it can bode well for for us and and just show to any young sort of players in south east london as, as we've said for many a year now that if, if they see a pathway starting off at, at Cholton, you know look where it can take you yeah i mean both those players are are shining examples of of what Steve Avery and the academy t uh, team have been doing for year after year after year, churning out great footballers, great products, and uh, level-headed, uh, level-headed players as well. Who uh, you know aren't just about the big time Charlie atmosphere. Just want to get their head down and work and, and develop their game. So uh, a lot of credit goes obviously to those guys, and you know even you know taking those those guys aside. You know, Conor Gallagher came and took his first chance on loan with us and is, is now at that standard. You know, we can't claim that we developed him all the way, but, you know, an integral part of his footballing journey as well. So it, it makes you feel proud. It also shows that we're probably a, a level below where where we should be for, for all of the, the positives that Charlton have as a club. As I don't know how many League One clubs in, in their history would have been sat there watching two of their academy products pulling on an England shirt um over the years and it, it does show i think just what this club really is about and, and owners come and owners go and managers come and managers go but that identity of of being a club rooted in its community and and able to give opportunities to youngsters and and let them go and and show what they can do on the absolute biggest stage is is something that all Charlton fans can be very very proud of and and hopefully long may that continue yeah andrew says that uh, steve avery uh, is a legend. Michael said he bumped into free exit to fans at Wembley last night. Three nice guys. They're looking forward to welcome us uh, down to St. James Park uh, on Good Friday, which we're looking forward to. Alan points out that we've got three home games after after Exeter. It's funny because we had those three away games in a row relatively recently, and Nathan uh, did moan quite a bit about that. But now it, it has sort of swings and roundabouts come back uh, the other way. Before we go into season ticket chat, I mean, this is an interesting point from Spam Fish. I mean, uh, the whole George Dobson situation, we know what that's been for a while now. He signed a pre-contract elsewhere. 
Um, so the only way he comes back is if he gets out of that pre contract and you how you would get out of that. I mean, I genuinely think it must be a transfer fee. <laughs> We'd have to buy him back. So um Spam says, At what point do you drop Dobson if we are safe and he is leaving? So I mean that does pose a big question there. Maybe it's slightly too early to be thinking about it, Tom, but towards the end of the season, you know, may- maybe Nathan will be looking at players who are more likely to be here next season. So will we find ourselves in a situation where George might not even play the last couple. Yeah, I guess the I guess the question is whether the person who's going to play there is already here. Obviously, Connor Coventry is going to be involved, but you'd imagine if there's going to be somebody alongside him, is it somebody that's already here and is it somebody that's fit? If that's not the case, I feel like George Dobson deserves the opportunity to see out the rest of this season with us if he wants to, because I think we all know that the decision or certainly the I would get the sense that the decision to to get rid of him is well certainly not one that most of the fans are happy with and maybe not one that Nathan Jones is particularly happy with either and maybe beyond his control sadly so I don't think Nathan Jones necessarily despite that is a a man who's going to put that above everything else if we need to win a game and that involves not playing George Dobson he will drop George Dobson and we've seen him do that with Alfie May already uh, but I feel like as fans we want to see him we feel like we deserve an opportunity to see him. I think it's the last home game, Shrewsbury. It'd be a shame if he didn't play some part in that as a kind of thank you for, for what he's done for us over the last few years, given the player he's been. Um, but yeah, if, if the players are here that are going to start next season, and I've said this a lot this season already, my focus is Charlton Athletic. If the players are here that he thinks are going to form that midfield next season, then let's start blooding them now and let's see how they get on. I'm just not sure that that's quite right. I imagine and my vibe is or feeling is that it will be Connor commentary and maybe one other. And I don't know if that person is currently here. So if that's the case, why not keep playing George until that point comes? But yeah, it's a difficult one because I guess people, I see someone mentioning Terry Taylor in there, um, maybe not fully fit or not fit at all. I don't think at the moment. And there's probably a few players like that. So it, it, there's obviously circumstances to be, to be kind of worked out, but yeah, um, as far as I'm concerned as a fan, the more we see him at the moment, the better, because I just love seeing him. It's just uh, it's a sad situation that he's probably going to go at the end of the year. Mm. As far as I know, Terry Taylor is fit because he was playing those, those 21 games. I mean, um, Nathan gives very little away on squad fitness. You'll hear it later on. We, you've probably heard it every week. But when I played the clip preview in Exeter, um, he was asked for fitness and he just gives nothing away about anything, really. But as far as I know, like Terry Taylor is, so unless anyone can correct me uh, on that. So Michael says, does anyone think Dobbo may make a U-turn now that Nathan Jones is our manager or is it too late? So again, as far as we understand, that pre-contract with, with the Hungarian side is, is binding. So he has agreed to sign, otherwise there's no point in having them. So, the well, you assume the only way you can get out of it is either so, another club buys him or somehow he buys himself out of that that deal, which I, I can't imagine would be very cheap. So, I, you know, I, I, I don't claim to be an expert on contract law, but I know what the word contract means, and it does sound um, like it would be very difficult to get out of that. All hell let loose, as I can't see Backinson uh, being the answer for, for next season. Well, obviously, due to go back to Sheffield Wednesday as it stands, um, I can't remember what his contract situation is. But, yeah, I'd be surprised if we, we sign him based on what we've seen uh, so far. Evening to Scott, who joins us late. Right, um, season ticket prices... Uh, have been released over the uh, international break. Uh, you will all be absolutely delighted to find out that I've made an Excel spreadsheet uh, as per normal so we can look at the uh, the rise from uh, last year to this year. So this is comparing um, the early bird prices uh, from last year to this year in, in just a few of the categories. Um, and I've also compared it to Millwall down the bottom uh, as well. So worth noting as well that... Um, so these are the phase one prices. So they end at mid like eleven fifty nine on May the tenth. Um, so if you want to get at these prices, you've got to get in there soon. Um, the bit that stood out for me is there's going to be one thousand safe standing seats, uh, which sounds like it's going to be in the covered end upper, uh, which, which I think will be absolutely brilliant. Obviously, pretty much everyone stands up there anyway, but hopefully that will really help with the atmosphere and, and be fantastic for everyone who sits up there. So yeah, well well done the club for sort of commit into that and uh, there's also i mean there's also a new section that sort of i mean they, they've talked about like fan zones outside and stuff but the other thing that was interesting apparently it's something that's been led by the supporters trust a 1620 section which again they they say is something that's been seen overseas before so again i'm not not entirely sure how that will work but it'd be interesting to see if it can have an effect on getting like-minded fans of that age group together because you can imagine if you're 
sort of new and you've got a small group of friends you go chanting with, you want to see more people and then you do your away games and stuff. So I can see that being a, a good thing if it works. But I mean, let's um, let's talk about the prices first. So um, you can see in zone one, which is the ridiculously expensive uh, prices in the middle of the uh, West Stand and the Allen Kerbishley stands, it's only gone up by a fiver, but it has gone up from £625 to £630 uh, for adults, 470, £475 to £480 for the under 21s, over 65s. Uh, under 18s have stuck at 145 under 11s are stuck at 60. Uh, there's also the five pound rise for students as well, which has gone from 235 pounds uh, to 240 pounds. Uh, the zone two, which is um, sort of the, the middling zone. So that's the outer sections of the uh, two side stands and the upper tier of the covered end uh, has gone up by nearly 6%. So that's gone up from 425 to 450 for adults, uh, 320 to 340 for under 21s. That's over 6% rise. Uh, and again, for 18s and 21, uh, and 11s, it's stayed at 130 or 60. Uh, it's gone up 205 to 225 for students, which is a, quite a large price rise. And then the cheaper ones, uh, so the bottom tier of the covered end and in the family quadrant, which is the one between the Allen Kerbisley stand and the covered end. Uh, for adults, it's gone up to 310 from 285. Uh, from the uh, under 21s over 65s, it's gone from 215 to 235, which is nearly a, over a 9% increase. And again, it stayed at 125 for under 18s. Under 11s are free uh, with a adult. So uh, every additional one, you have to pay 30 quid. So that's not too bad at all. Um, Tom, I'll go on the prices first before we compare it to Millwall. Obviously, it depends where you sit. Um, how, how has it affected you? Is it a price rise that would put you off? I was thinking about this earlier today. Like, So I sit in North Lower, which I think is zone three. So technically the biggest increase, but also the cheapest ticket. Uh, and I sat there before it became the really cheap area. So I then benefited from the fact that I sat there anyway. My big feeling is with season tickets, <clears throat> you, there's no real way I don't think of doing this. You can't really assess the whether it's worth it until the end of the season. I'd argue this season, £285 is ridiculous. I wouldn't, if I'd have known what had happened, I wouldn't have paid 20 quid for this year's season ticket. But there's no way they can do it on a pay what you like at the end of the season because there's, People are just going to take the mick. But next year, if we get promoted and we romp to the League One title, 310 is a steal, particularly if they then say, well, we're going to freeze it for anybody who bought in the early bird for the championship or whatever. So it's really hard to judge. I still feel like, uh, so I'm paying 310, I think, based on that. Still very cheap for, I mean, it's expensive for some people and, and cheap for others. So, you know, I'm not talking about salaries or what people have got in terms of money. But in terms of comparing to other teams in this division, it seems like a, very cheap per game price, I would say. Compared to the away tickets I pay, it's probably a, a lot cheaper. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's very reasonable. I'm pretty sure Joe sits at zone one, so might see this all completely differently because his season ticket's twice the price of mine. So it's a complete complete contrast. But, uh, yeah, it's really difficult to judge whether it's worth it or not because, as I say, it depends what you go to football for. Uh, and if you go to football for good football and for winning games, you'd argue that that is an absolute rip-off. But if you go to spend time with your mates and have a beer and socialise, then uh, then it's probably not. So it's hard it's hard to judge really but i think that there's not much of an increase um I, I guess just maybe inflation um and obviously i think that's was it the second phase of pricing it's pretty much the same as that i think that's that's pretty good really i don't think there's too much to argue about although i'm sure some people will and as i say i'm at the lower end of the prices so it's very easy for me to say that so it's probably worth asking the same question to joe because he'll have a, a different perspective and that's totally fair enough well, yeah, I've got I mean, I've got two questions for Joe. Obviously, one of which is the same question. The second of which is why on earth do you pay that amount of money for League One football? Because so you sit in League One, so you paid six two five this season. I don't know if you got Valley Gold, which I think I don't know if that takes a little bit off. Um, and you, and you're going to pay six hundred and thirty pounds for 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 this season. Uh, yeah, don't have Valley Gold because I can't afford it, as well as the uh, season <laughs> ticket. Um, is the is the honest answer there? So that we. I'm in zone one. I got those seats when that was my first season ticket. It's now going to be my 32nd uh, season ticket in those in that same seat. Um, so for me, it's it's an absolute. Uh, sorry, 31st. Yeah. So it's, for me, it's it's one of those things. I've always sat there. That's been my seat. Um, and, and we got those literally the the first season the stand opened. For me, my dad and my son, it's 1,200 quid for a season of League One football, and the the problem with the pricing for me is 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 it it, it 
they handcuff themselves at the start of the season. So if we're on a good run and we're looking like we're going to get promoted and you're going to want to drive some people into the stadium to, to, to get a taste of that atmosphere, you can't really do anything with the pricing of the season tickets because per game I'm paying £27.40 a game. So you can't have a price that's lower than that in, in my area. Um, and you can't sell them really in the East End lower than that because people will buy them and then sit in, in, in other seats and in the more sort of premium zone. So that that hampers them in terms of attracting new fans. And that will always be the case. And the second thing is there's no real reward for loyalty for, for those that do trade up. And why would you trade up from zone two to zone one? And if you move across an aisle, you're paying an extra 200 quid. How does that make any sense for, for anyone to do? Um, we've got a, a group of us that all sit together. Um, you know, I, I, I love where I sit, and, and, but I don't think it's worth it. And you go from the club saying, oh, yeah, we've got one of, one of the most affordable tickets in the league, but we've also got probably the least affordable ticket in the league. So you go literally from one end of the spectrum to the other. Uh, and the club have carried on with this philosophy that, that was thought up by Roland to, to try, and, try and drive some revenue up. And no one's had the, the wherewithal to sit down and, and really look at the, the way in which we're trying to incentivize season tickets, incentivize new fans in at, at, at a pricing level. And, and I know that, you know, you do get people who tune in uh, sometimes who are involved in, in some of those circles who can maybe help with some of these decisions, but it seems to be that it's just copy and paste and price goes up and we know that what will happen. Phase two pricing will come out after this one, after the early bird. And next season, that will be the price that we have to pay. Uh, so they'll announce your season ticket price in, in May uh, for next season. And probably for me, I'm going to be edging up towards 650 quid. Um, and it was 400 quid like six or seven seasons ago. So, so the, the rate of inflation on my ticket is, is exceptional. Mm-hmm. Um, not only is it going up and up, they've increased the fans as well. So I, I'd love the club to actually sit down and engage with fans on on this subject and try and find a way to get more people into the stadium because that's what drives their revenues more than trying to squeeze five or 20 quid out of every fan that's in, in their seat. Yeah, there we go. And just on the bottom of the screen there, you can see I've compared it to Millwall's. So just, just on the adult one, so Millwall's highest adult season ticket is £475. So obviously much lower uh, than our highest, which is 630 um it's slightly more than our zone two tickets and but they i mean then if you look at their lowest tickets they've got a 370 adult in in the family section um but i mean we've got 380 they've got 380 in most sections where most people can buy because obviously in the family section you've got to have a kid um so yeah when you compare our prices to millwall especially obviously a, a championship club it is quite enlightening uh, they've got obviously slightly different groupings in terms of the under 18s and whatnot so in some cases you win in some cases you lose obviously you have to go and watch millwall so you lose but the one thing i did notice is they don't have student tickets at millwall um, which I'm sure there's a joke there to be made about not being clever enough or something, but I will not be uh, making that joke. I mean, just quickly, Tom, the safe standing. I, I, I'm really excited to see that. I think I think it looks great when 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 you see that at other grounds. Um, so yeah, I, I think that'll be excellent. Yeah, they've talked about it for a little while, haven't they? And it, it sounded like it was coming. I'm surprised it's it's coming as quickly as it as it has. But I'm the same. I think it's a good thing. Um, I know a few other clubs have done it. I haven't had an opportunity to actually stand anywhere i don't think that that's had it yet but when you see it it looks great obviously i i don't know if it can change the numbers up there i guess not because you technically have a seat with it but if everybody's standing and if that encourages people to move back up there because i know numbers have dwindled a little bit in recent recent seasons and, and rightly so based on what we've been served up then yeah then that's great let's get people up there it's gonna obviously there's going to be a downside in the people who do like to sit up there. And I imagine it's few and far between because most people stand may have to move. Um, but, but if you can get everybody up there in one place and as a result, move people who stand elsewhere, who inconvenience people, then, then that makes sense as well. So yeah, it's always a challenge. I find when you go to away games and you've got people standing, people sitting and it's a constant battle between the two and seems to happen everywhere. But here, if you've got a, a place that's okay for standing and a place that isn't, it's very clear kind of what you do so yeah it'll be interesting to see what it does to the atmosphere because obviously that's where the majority of it's generated anyway um but yeah i'm sure the people that that do stand sit up there currently will be looking forward to, to testing that out and for those people who are coming maybe as day trippers every now and again people in london or whatever or you know if i'm bringing mates along for for a game maybe we'll go up there for a game instead if there's space or whatever so yeah it'll be interesting to see to see how it affects games and, and uh, uh the atmosphere 
Mm, right, Joseph said, I think it's great value minus the beer and food for a day out with my son, the clubber, encouraging us to bring our children with us. And yeah, like I say, especially in the family section, we can get the under 11 ticket free. Um, that That's certainly good. Um, yeah, my, Michael said, it's hard to put a value on uh, this thing of ours. It's both worthless uh, and priceless. Yeah, I mean, that means the same thing effectively, doesn't it? <laughs> but yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, certainly feels worthless sometimes after home games. Um, Michael says uh, the safe standing would have been a bit better if it was at the lower end of the covered end, the, the lower covered end. Everyone stands up at the back anyway. Uh, Paul said it should have been the whole of H and J blocks, not the last eight rows, uh, but the whole uh, of of the uh, the upper. Uh, Paul says it's important for the club to engage with teens, but there is a danger that they alienate other fans. I hope the club does all right by those season ticket holders who's lost their seats. Uh, to safe standing. Yeah, that will be interesting exactly how that works out. Right, we're going to turn our attention to Exeter shortly, but I did say I uh, just want to highlight um, something that Nathan spoke about earlier on today, uh, which is the fact that they had the uh, the Upbeats join them uh, with the uh, the first team for training uh, over the international break. One thing that happened during the week was uh, you got a visit from the Upbeats to, to Sparrows Lanes for a training session for World Down Syndrome Day. I'm guessing uh, that put a smile on everybody's face and uh, did they give you a few tips on, uh, on what to do? Well, it didn't put that much a smile. We lost, lost the five side against them, so we were... We were uh, we were a bit miffed with that, but no, look, it's great to see them. They said they do great work in the in the community and and everything. They're a big part of of, of everything we do here at uh, at at Sparrows Lane. And and as I said, it just goes to show what what strength we have here and the community strength we have here at this football club, which we which Charlton, which we are now, but we've always been proud of here at Charlton. So it's great to see them. Yeah, they did put a, a smile on their face. You know, they they were delighted to be, and it was good to see them because they uh, they brought a real energy to the, to the place. There we go. Nathan uh, couldn't hide his disappointment at the fact that the side were were, were beaten in the end. <laughs> he, he took that too competitively. He was a bit miffed, he said. But yeah, great to see the upbeats down there. Obviously, the upbeats walk is coming up at the end uh, of the season, last home game uh, against Shrewsbury. Me and Ben have already signed up. There's a Charlton Live team. I'll put the link uh, on our social media shortly if you guys could uh, donate uh, towards us uh, for the upbeats. That'll be great. And obviously, we've got to say massive congratulations to, to Jason and everyone at the Community Trust. Uh, for winning the uh, EFL League One Community Club uh, of the Year Award, which um, which is a massive honour and uh, very well deserved. Right, we're going to have a quick break here on Charlton Live, the big match preview. When we come back, we will turn our attention to Good Friday's trip down to Exeter City. Thinking about a new kitchen or bathroom? Find professional, independent local installers with free home surveys, itemised quotes and protected payments, trading standards approved contracts and workmanship warranties. The British Institute of Kitchen, Bedroom, Bathroom Installations accredits installers to ensure they are police checked, fully insured and experienced. Take the risk out of home improvement. Visit bikbbi.org.uk Hello fellow addicts. I'm so excited to tell you all about our micropub, The River Owl House. The River Owl House is based in East Greenwich. It has six pub of the year awards, an ever-changing selection of amazing beer it's owned by Charlton fans, walkable to the ground in just 20 minutes with buses that go direct to the Valley too. If your matchday routine includes a drink with your friends, you must join your fellow addicts in the river. See you soon. Right, welcome back to Charlton Live. This is the big match preview. Uh, we just heard the ads there, including hearing from the South East London Pub of the Year, uh, the River Ale House. So uh, well done, Joe, for that. Um, and uh, yeah, now it's time to turn our attention uh, to the Good Friday game down at Exeter City. Now, of course, we always get a guest in uh, from an opposition uh, podcast. Um, there, there is a podcast out there called the My New Football Club uh, podcast, which is very, very loosely based around uh, Exeter City, uh, or more really based about the personal life of uh, this man here. This is John Beer, who joins us, uh, <laughs> Exeter City fan, uh, also covers uh, the club for BBC Radio Devon as well. John, great to have you on. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, I'm brilliant. Uh, a little bit more comfortable now that our season's taken a little bit of an upwards turn but um yeah I'm good thanks for having me yeah I mean b- before we get into to my new football club I mean li- our, our listeners will remember we had David Earl on on last season to talk about the show but I mean it's gone from strength to strength in that time and, and further and further away from Exeter City actually but it's a great listen but um, let's talk about the Grecians first I mean it's been a really bizarre season uh, which I have sort of lived vicariously through for you and David um started off incredibly well I think you were top after after eight games. 
uh, and then you went on um, what sounded like quite an impressive winless run, a 13-game winless run, which um, was only only beaten by one side, which was us when we went 16 games. Uh, you've, you've picked up a little bit since then. I mean, how, how do you describe how this season's gone for you guys? Yeah, it's been really topsy turvy, as, as you said. There, we started the season thinking, "Wow, we've got a, we've got a real squad here," and then we th- we found out that maybe we were lacking a little bit in the striker department. Um, you know, we I think we had a striker until Sonny Cox came in. I don't think we had a striker with more than one goal. Um, so yeah, we've, we've yeah, like you said, had a topsy turvy season. That thirteen game, I think it might have even been more than that, where we didn't win was uh, was a really weird time for the club because it'd been the first time in years that we hadn't actually been. All right. It had been the first time we were being pretty dire. We were lucky for the last sort of three, four years. We've been brilliant under Matt and now Gary Caldwell. We'd actually been good, but this was a, the first time we actually had a little bit of something to worry about, maybe. But I mean, if you if you listen to our, our pod, I was always pretty confident that he would turn it around. He's, I, I, having known him personally, he's. I can see how good of a coach and manager he is. Sometimes results don't go for you. You've got to understand that. Exit City. We don't have the biggest budget. We're uh, we're we're having to do sort of money ball style transfers. Like Reese Cole is, is a perfect example. But yeah, I'm I'm happy that we we've turned it around. I was fully confident that he would, but there was times where maybe I was was doubting myself a little bit. You mentioned the strikers briefly there, John. I think you're one of the lowest scorers in the league. What what's that down to? Is it the style of play? Is it players not taking chances? Is it just bad luck? What what's the reason behind that? Because I think most of the teams around us and you, we're pretty similar, are sort of 40, 50 goals and you're down at like 30-something, I think. Yeah, it's actually a really good question. It's something that we haven't really been able to put our finger on all season. We've had, I think the main problem was we haven't had an out-and-out out number nine until Mo Issa came in in January. I think we were playing James Scott up front, who was sort of more of a, a winger, traditionally a left-sided winger. Um, then we had sort of Admiral Muskwe come in from Luton, who was an out-and-out nine, but got injured really early on. And then when he came back, wasn't quite what we needed. I think the style of play does suit us. We just haven't had that right person in the right place. We seem to be able to work the ball into the right area, get the ball into the into the box, into some dangerous positions, but just not able to have someone there to tap it home. But since Sonny Cox has started and come back off loan, he's been he's been a real bright spark and someone who I can see sort of glimpses of Ollie Watkins in, that what we had before, a real tenacity not afraid to make mistakes uh will shoot from anywhere which is something we didn't have before so um yeah I think up until Sonny Cox started scoring just not having someone who was naturally in the right place at the right time but the build-up play before that was has always been great we've got some real good creators Tom Carroll Reese Cole Ryan Woods we've got some real good technical players just struggling to get someone in that actual position to score we've we've sort of said in chat live a number of times um that that League One's a bit of a um, uh, a bit of a, a weaker uh, proposition than than it has been traditionally, uh, and obviously quite underwhelmed with, with our season. Um, you're in the same sort of part of the part of the table as us, and although we won four one and reverse fixture, it was very very close until the the sending off, and that really did change the game. So, um, are you underwhelmed with? With your season overall, are you pretty chuffed? Like, how how do you sort of rate where where you guys are at the minute? <laughs> yeah, see, I get I get a lot of stick about this on Twitter. I'm chuffed. Like, if we stay in League One, for me, that's a, a success for now. We've just had a really tricky period where we've had an overhaul of academy players. So we lost Archie Collins, Josh Key, Joel Randall, Jack Sparks, all of these really good academy prospects that we had come through, which helped us get promoted from League Two, then kept us in League One pretty comfortably last season. So we're in this weird period where we're having to rely on players that might not be as good that we... So we... The brilliance of Exeter City is we pay these players not a lot because they're academy prospects and they come through and we get them on the cheap, right? But to replace uh, Archie Collins or Josh Key is really expensive. So we can't bring in players of that same calibre. So we're really struggling in that transitional period right now until we get some more academy products through. But I'm completely happy with how our season's gone. If we stay up, it's a success. We're just trying to build, keep ourselves in this division. I said at the start of the season, the second season in the league one's always your hardest because your players get pinched and then you've got to try and maintain what you did last season. But no, I'm I'm over the moon. And like I said, if we stay up, it'll be a, a successful season and something with Gary and Marcus's recruitment strategy we can really build on for, for next season. Uh, quick questions coming from the chat. All hell let loose says, who do Charlton need to worry about on Friday from your side? 
Yeah, so we, it's, it's a really good question. At the moment, we've got a lot of real threats. I think if Reese Cole's fit, he'll be he'll be the man to look out for. I, I mean, how he was playing in, in the eighth tier of football last season, I, I don't know. He must have been ridiculous. I think he was a PE teacher as well for, for parts of last last year. So he's he is absolutely superb. I think someone who fell out of love uh, with football, but the, someone we've managed to sort of reinstate their love for football if you like I'd look out for Sonny Cox if he starts again we're a bit mix and match at the moment we don't really have a solid starting 11 or consistent starting 11 so Sonny Cox keep an eye out for him he's he's a youngster that I think can really go on to do big things so like I said before similar to Ollie Watkins and we've got a, a, a new young chap from um from Halifax I believe we signed him from in, in January Milenik Ali who's frighteningly quick like keep your eyes up for those three Excellent. Um, I mean, to, I just want to understand a little bit more about about how Exeter City's run as well. So I think I think it was this year you done. Is it twenty years of fan ownership now? I mean, so you you yourself have been a, a trustee. I mean, what what challenges does does the way that Exeter City is owned sort of bring for a, a club trying to compete at League One level with with the likes of you know us and and big clubs who actually do better than us as well? Yeah, some 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 really obvious challenges, which are obviously financial challenges. Um, you know, we don't have a, a rich businessman putting money in. We survive solely off selling academy products, ticket sales, that kind of thing. So naturally, we're going to have one of the smallest budgets in the division. I think we're second smallest this season. Um, so yeah, I think that those are the main challenges. But for me, there's way more benefits that, than challenges. I would rather be fan owned. Um, be in League Two, be wherever we are, fan owned with full control of our football club, knowing that it's never going to spend beyond its means, keep itself in a place where you'll always have a football team to support. I mean, a lot of people, or some people I should say, would rather have somebody come in and just splash the cash. I think Exit City is a real opportunity for a business person to come in and really take it to the next level. Um, it's got no debt. In fact, it's got money in the bank, which is not what can be said for most uh, clubs in the Football League. So, it would be an interesting proposition for somebody to take on. But for me personally, I would always have it fan known the way it is, even if it means we have to stay where we are forever. I'd rather rather it be like that because it's it's such a special club. But it's, you know, like you said, the challenges are competing with, with the likes of yourselves, Derby, you know, the, the real big signs in the division who can sort of splash the cash if you like. Mm, yeah, it's, it's painful for us that we are seen as the big club. But we're, we're, I think we're below you. Aren't we? It's 15th versus 16th on Saturday, on a Good Friday. Massive, massive league one contest that one just fine i, I want to talk my new uh, my new football club um I, i'm a big big fan of the pod um it, it's been a bit of a roller coaster this season obviously with with the way it started off so well and and, and david getting carried away about playoffs <laughs> and, and you were sort of trying to keep everyone calm but then as the season's rolled on you know you, you guys were sticking up i'd say for, for gary a little bit now you're out of the woods i mean you've you've gone on a bit of a change in direction and now we're hearing about your the way you recognise your housemates and all that, which anyone who listens um, will, I, I can't know if I can even say it on our show, but um, tell, it, tell us about working with David Earl and how that pod's come about and, and what you enjoy about very loosely speaking about Exeter City with, with a wide audience. <laughs> yeah, I mean, firstly, he's super, super talented. Someone is just like, someone like him is that is so naturally funny. It's like a pleasure to work with. He just makes you laugh every 10 seconds. He's, he's, he's brilliant. His football knowledge winds me up slightly especially lower league but I mean uh, uh, you know not everyone supports lower league clubs like I do or like we do um but the pod was really came around from a picture that came around what was circling around Twitter of me working for BBC Radio Devon and David sort of had at the same time had put a tweet out saying oh we want someone that knows actually something about Exeter City to come on and he had his DMs and replies flooded with with my at he asked me I came on it was meant to be a one-off thing and then I've done every episode since um and, and when Joe sort of took a step back because he was busy, he asked me to be co-host and it was, yeah, it was just gone from strength to strength. I, I think we're something like 16th in the in the UK for football, which is ridiculous when you, when you really think about it. But yeah, I mean, it's a pleasure to work with him. We do loads of pods every week. You get some amazing guests on. Um, and yeah, it was it's something I never thought I'd do. I don't think I'd ever do podcasting, but it's something I found that I really love probably more than, than sports broadcasting. So well, being on the radio. So yeah, no, it's, it's great. And if anyone wants to listen, I definitely recommend it. Yeah, I'd recommend it as well. If only to hear Alfie's um, album that he's bringing out, which I'm really looking forward to <laughs> as well with songs, songs all about John and what's he, what he gets up to in, he, in his private life. John, uh, it's been a pleasure having you on. Uh, I look forward to, uh, you've got an episode out this week, which I haven't listened to yet. So I look forward to listening to that tomorrow. And uh, yeah, good luck for the rest of the season. 
Cheers, no worries. Thank you very much, chaps. Thanks for having me. See ya. There we, there we go. That's John Beer from uh, the uh, My New Football Club podcast and BBC Radio. Devin, he is a, he is a, a serious broadcaster as well, but that, that podcast is um, absolutely excellent. I definitely recommend um, that you guys check it out. Um, it's very, they don't talk about football much, but it is very funny, so I definitely, I definitely uh, recommend it. Right, let's look ahead to the game uh, with Exeter City. Uh, from our point of view, um, Nathan Jones was asked to look ahead to the game uh, by Terry, as per always, and starts off uh, with uh, something resembling team news. Before the break, and, and with the players away now, they all come back in a, in a good state of health. I know before the break we had Lloyd Jones who had been missing due to injury. Um, has the break enabled him to come back into contention? Well, he's closer to where he was, and uh, Chuck Saniki and, and people like that, they're all, they're all closer than what they were, so that's the, the good thing. We have used it. You know, that's been the positive for it. We've been allowed, one, be able to get some good work into them, and two, being able to get a few people back. Yeah, Chuck Saniki and Kane Ramsey were the two I was also going to ask about. Are they, are they closer to, to come back? Yeah, both are I said, exactly the same as I said. They, they're both really clo- uh, you know, much closer than, than what they were before the break, so um, the squad's in a lot healthier position. Cool. We've got um, Exeter City up next, a trip down to Devon. Uh, a chance to leapfrog them in the table as well uh, and extend our own game unbeaten run. But we're against the side that bounced back from a, a poor run, a five-game um, uh, winless run. Now they've got back-to-back wins. So uh, they'll be a confident opponent. Uh, absolutely. But look, if, if we, we take every game on its merits. We, we know that every game's a different challenge. They're well-drilled, well-coached. Um, always a tough place to go good place to go I enjoy, usually enjoy time down there in terms of the city and, 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 and so on but it's a tough game and we know that but we're not we just want to get points for us we're not worried if we leapfrog or, or whatever all we want to do is, is make sure we keep this run going get to the level of performance that we want because we dipped slightly below it at Fleetwood albeit in horrific conditions um, so we want to get back now to, to the levels that we, we were showing pre-Fleetwood and you'll be uh, backed by again another sellout out uh, Valley uh, Valley trip uh, away crowd. It's uh, inspiring, isn't it? Ah, they're brilliant. They're just brilliant. They're just great. They're positive. The energy they bring, however they are, they are just magnificent. And we're we look we're, we're delighted. We expect it. And then they've had two week break because they've had uh, you know seven away games since in my this will be in my tenth game and the seven away games. So they've been at every game. They've been vocal. They've driven the team on. Be magnificent. So we are coming to expect that now, but we don't take that for granted. There we go. That's Nathan um, ending there speaking about obviously the excellent away support. Uh, and as pointed out by Scott there, it says it's uh, it's about 1,400 going. It's sold out, isn't it, in, in the away end again down there. We've sold out so many away games this season. And, you know, as plenty of people pointed out on, on social media when it was announced that we've sold out. I mean, uh, th- this is, with with all due respect, I mean, it's not a massive game for us. But, you know, it's Good Friday. It's gonna, it, Exeter is a great place to go down to if you're going down there. Get down there early and explore and, and find the pubs and the whatever else you like to look at in, uh, in, in, in away cities as well. And it will be a great atmosphere. Um, we, we, need to, we need to pick up a little bit in terms of performance, as, as Nathan mentioned there, and he did uh, reiterate, albeit on, on a pretty bad pitch. Uh, we didn't play very well at Fleetwood, Tom. Um, we didn't play particularly well against Carlisle either in, in stages when, when we um, beat them 3-2 at the Valley. So if we are safe, which I, I, I keep reiterating, I think we are, we we need we need to lay groundwork as we always say at this time. But actually, performance wise, we need we need to make sure we keep those levels up for for many reasons between now and the end of the season. Yeah, and I don't think Nathan Jones is not a manager. I don't think that's going to let people get complacent at all. So I, I I don't feel like it's complacency. And if it is, he will find that out, and I'm sure he will make it clear that that's not acceptable. Obviously, by your very nature of potentially being safe, I understand that players are you know, you're getting towards the end of a busy season and all that sort of stuff, but he will try and keep the levels up. And we're against teams that are scrapping for their lives. Obviously, as we know, Fleetwood, the uh, playing surface wasn't quite what we would have wanted to be able to play our our football. Um, Carlisle, again, a team, I say scrapping for their lives. They're they're probably gone, but maybe not. But we we struggled up there earlier in the season as well. Um, So, Yeah, I don't read too much into it. You go through phases of playing well and not. I think the important thing is you're still picking up results, whether they be wins or draws. Um, But yeah, you're right. You don't want the season to peter out. You want to finish on a a positive because I know, and I think I spoke about this a few weeks ago, I know we've recently had our fingers burnt with that. You know, you think under Adkins when he was obviously wanting us to go and kick on and then we didn't. And that's been the sort of pattern of a few seasons now. But I think under Nathan Jones, there's there's the opportunity here now to build something. And 
that could start straight away, as I say, particularly if he's had the international break to start planning ahead for next year as well. So, yeah, you don't want it to fizzle out. There's also the things like, you know, lots and lots of people will make up their mind about season tickets immediately. They're either going to renew or they're not, irrespective of what happens. But if people are sort of on the fence and they're thinking, oh, maybe I will, maybe I'm not. If you come to a game towards the end of the season and you see us win 4-0, it's going to make a big difference as opposed to if you come and see a boring nil-nil. So, yeah, it's uh, you don't want the season to peter out, of course, just as fans, as I said earlier, when we were talking about value for money. I want to see a couple of good games still with the, the remainder that we've got. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, and if nothing else, I think Nathan Jones, and I said this when he first came in, all he can do is finish as high as it's possible to do. We're not going to go up. We're probably now not going to go down. So his aim is just to, to get as high as he can. And obviously a win will, will help that. Mm, yeah, I mean, Sam says, I feel that we need another six points uh, to definitely... Uh, secure our place in League One. Although, like I keep saying, I really don't think it'll be that high. And we're on 45 currently. Um, I'd be shocked if we needed more than about 46, 47. But we'll we'll, we'll see how that um, how, how that plays out. Um, in terms in terms of team news, I'm gonna put it in the chat. So it's a conversation I feel like we have before every game. Joseph says he's like to see Ashley come in now in goal. I mean, I stood might have done better with a goal. Didn't uh, against uh, against Fleetwood. Obviously, he had that howler a couple of weeks ago. Um, against uh, Northampton away. <laughs> Are you in the mood to chop and change, Joe? At, at some point, it might happen. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not that fussed really between the the two of them. I think I'd be disappointed coming into next season if if either of them were our first choice after after this season. I, I don't think that either of them have stood up enough to be. Um, to 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 say that they're going to be a a goalkeeper that's going to lead us in in a, in a promotion charge, which is fine. Uh, but but we you know we need to go and probably find someone a little bit better in terms of changes. I just wanted him to settle on a team that thinks he's going to go and win a few games. And and extra for me, it's an opportunity to do the double over someone. We've got three opportunities of that in the last run of games. And can you imagine going through an entire league one season without doing the double over somebody? I mean, that's just a, a shocking indictment of, of your year. So uh, let's get Alfie, you know, the opportunity to secure that golden boot. Um, it, let's have, you know, a, a real sign of passion, a real building block. And, and for me, the season is over, but, but next season starts now. This is the opportunity to really build and build and build and get that momentum. And if you're looking to attract players in the summer, there's nothing that's going to help you more than an absolute sterling run of games uh, going towards the end of the season and showing that there's some real momentum here under Nathan Jones going into next season. Mm, yeah, I'll just give you a couple of stats ahead of uh, ahead of the game. So Exeter uh, are unbeaten in their last three, uh, including winning their last two games. Uh, only lost one in the last five. They've only lost two of their last 10 home league games as well. So not doing too bad at St. James Park. I mean, the one that still stands out for me uh, is the fact that we've kept one clean sheet in 27 uh, league games now. I mean, all hell let loose put in the chat saying, with some of our comical defending this season, should we be looking at major personnel changes to our defenders for next season? Uh, he says, if so, is Terrell Thomas the answer? So, I mean, the question has been put to you, Tom. But is is Terrell part of the side next season for you? I think it's probably likely to be part of the side Friday. I was going to say, if Terrell Thomas is the answer, I'm not sure what the question is, to be totally honest. But I think so I'm you, pretty... So, Lusa's best less player. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, I'm pretty consistent in saying that I like consistency across that back five. Um um, and for this season, I think that that is the players we've got. A bit like Joe with the goalkeepers. I can't think of many of the defenders that if we didn't have them starting next season, I'd be that disappointed with. I think I know Lloyd Jones had a bit of a dip recently, but I think overall, I think I'm happy with with him. Um, and I think the fullbacks, certainly towards the end of the season, uh, Eden and, and Watson have impressed. Uh, and a couple that are out injured as well have have looked okay. So, I think that it's okay there, but I think the centre backs and the goalkeeper that it's so crucial that the communication between them, the understanding between them, is tight knit, and that's why I call for consistency. But like Joe, I'm not sure Isted or, or Maynard Brewer necessarily sort of garners that leadership quality at the back, and I'm not sure any of the players, particularly in front of them, have done too well either. Um, so I don't think Terrell Thomas is the answer for a team that want to you know, boss league one next season, but 
may be okay as a as a player to bring off the bench. Uh, and I think that's the same with a lot of these players, really. They're probably good squad players. Some of them, not at all, but some of them probably good squad players, but very few of them probably starting 11 next year, I think. Yeah, I mean, Andrew says uh, Terrell Thomas is only howlers when he tries to join the attack. I can't re- remember him costing us uh, a goal. That's what Andrew says. I mean, yeah, he's he's not the best with the ball at his feet. I think that I think that's certainly fair to say. And you know, overall, is that his job? Not not particularly. But do do we need someone who can play the ball out a bit better? Maybe. I mean, that, they're all questions. I mean, heck, he's good at playing the ball out on the whole. But then obviously, he he has had those howlers. So it's a uh, it, it's a difficult one. And Michael's pointed out that we did do the double over Cheltenham. Uh, this season, um, which, which is correct, because we beat them home and away, including my first away win in, in 11 months. Uh, Peter says, I agree with Joe, we need to spend money on a new goalkeeper. Neither Ashley or Harry Eisted are good enough for a top two uh, team. David says we should bring back Pope. I think I think, I think think he's busy at the moment, but um, <laughs> we'll see. Michael would like to see Dylan Phillips come back, uh, which is an option. Sam says, we've got to keep Carnum and May up front. Um, maybe uh, keep Dobbo as captain, offer it to someone else, uh, see who is able to lead the squad. Yeah, that's an interesting point because uh, we have seen Lloyd Jones wear the captain armband a couple of times recently, if I, if I remember uh, correctly. Ian reckons that promotion teams do have the spine that we lack, uh, definitely. I mean, one, one question I've just written down on Team News is it, w- would we maybe find a chance for Kazenga Luwalua to start the game on Friday, Joe? Could you see a way that could happen? I mean, I think. I don't think he, he would fit in, in the three five two as the wing back. So I think the only way that happens is if we change format. I could be wrong. He, he, maybe, he, maybe he can do the defensive side that I'm not aware of, but I, I don't think that's the case. <clears throat> yeah, and I know I don't I don't think he's going to be uh, chasing back too aggressively. Um, it'll be a bit like having uh, a Blackett Taylor, but without the pace if he if he needed it potentially at his stage of his career. Um, I mean, Nathan Jones said he could put him on the moon for a year and then drop him in and he'll do some minutes. So it's going to take a long way from being able to do a few minutes to, to be able to start a game, um, although he has had a couple of weeks training. I think for players like Luar Luar, they're, they're great assets to have in and around the squad. But again, my question would be, is he going to be part of the uh, the, the solution next season? Is it just a short-term uh, to tide us over until the end of this season? And if it is just short-term then uh, let's use him as a as a short-term player and, and not invest the minutes into him uh, in terms of uh, at, at the expense of somebody else, unless he's got a system that he wants to try that the while the while opens up for him that is completely different and maybe at the tip of a diamond, say. If, then, then, yeah, I think there's a bit more of an argument. But for me, I, I'd rather be getting the minutes into the likes of Carnu and, and even Tyrese, who who hopefully will be part of the, the squad next season and, and really pushing on to... Uh, to claim a starting berth and, and to get their contracts, um, or in the case of Tyrese, get a contract extension if he, if he wants it. Mm, yeah, Dan Windham's just pointed out he'd like the Lincoln goalkeeper, Lucas Jensen. Um, oh, Lincoln are absolutely flying uh, at this moment in time as well. Paul Davenport says, uh, Nicky Pope is busy counting his money. Uh, well, that's Rich from Paul after he went in hospitality up at Fleetwood, of course. Um, all hell let loose saying, maybe, maybe do we want to see a bit more of Ness to see if he can stay next season? Also asked the question... Um, about Hector, says he can't see him staying uh, next season. Uh, Adoy says Lucas Jensen from Lincoln and Sarpong. We were due from Fleetwood are two that we should be looking back. Uh, obviously, we had Brendan, didn't we, before we uh, we let him go and uh, it, it didn't turn out that way. Um, yeah, just finally then for those travelling fans, Tom, I mean, it's going to be it's going to be a good day with good numbers down there and it just shows like uh, that there is that there there is a fan base amongst us. You know, Ho- hopefully at some point we'll start we'll start turning up in more numbers at home. But we we do travel really well and 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 people will be enjoying their their day on Good Friday and hopefully hopefully the lads can send them back happy. Well, also, hopefully they make it. And the reason I'm not going this year is because I tried to get to Bristol Rovers last Good Friday and failed. So I uh, got stuck on the coach on the M25. So, yeah, that's uh, that was a sad day. But I hope they make it this year. Um, and whilst I'm not bitter about that or the fact that all the away games I went to were over Christmas under Appleton, where we lost pretty much every single one, um, I do hope they have a good time. I hope they enjoy it. Um, I'll be joining the away fans for the Cambridge game. Um, so that again, just because I get a lift there by my mum, so uh, that always helps. So uh, yeah, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Uh, I think our away support for what three, four years now has been absolutely sensational. And uh, yeah, I, I don't see that dropping anytime soon. It's you see the same people every week, which is amazing. And um, yeah, fair play to every single one going because it's a it's a long old long old trip. 
Excellent stuff. Right, we've run out of time on uh, this week's uh, big match preview. We might come back on Saturday. I ain't decided yet, and I haven't actually asked anyone. <laughs> oh, hell, let loose, says it's Tom on his mum's passport, <laughs> which is very good. Um, yeah, I ain't, I ain't really decided about Saturday. We don't normally do a show in between the games on Easter, but at the same time, uh, I might be a bit of a loose end on Saturday. So I'll see. I'll see. I'll let you know via social media uh, if, if I've got time to do maybe a short little show. Uh, to look back at the game against Exeter City and, of course, ahead to Easter Monday's home game uh, with Stevenage. Uh, I think the women are at the Valley on Sunday as well, so maybe uh, we can uh, you can check that one out as well. I might go to that game uh, as well. Right, uh, yeah, as I say, we've run out of time. Massive thanks to everyone who's joined us uh, live on YouTube uh, this evening. Make sure you subscribe uh, to our YouTube uh, channel. Um, massive thanks to John Beer from My New Football Club. He was an excellent guest uh, earlier on. Big thanks to Tom and to Joe for joining me this week. Cheers, lads. Yeah, cheers. So good to speak to the pair of you. I'm Louis Mendes. It has been Charlton Live, sponsored by the British Institute of Kitchen, Bedroom and Bathroom Installation. We might be back on Saturday. Uh, if not, we'll be back uh, next Thursday. I'll let you know. <laughs>